following episode most likely contains graphic language, details of violence, and murder, and may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. What is up, everybody? And welcome to episode 47 of Murder With My Mother, the true crime podcast where I talk murder with my mother. Hey, everybody. And good to see you again. We've been away for a while. We have. And we are back today. Life has been a little hectic recently. Mm -hmm. So we apologize that we haven't been here. I think we missed one month. One (laughs) One month. One whole month. But no, but you know what? That's why we love you guys because we know that you are understanding when stuff comes up. And this is our passion project. So if we can't find passion in that moment or we don't have time, because you have two fucking kids and a whole lot of shit you got to do when you're returning back to the real world after maternity leave. So yeah, I mean, I have a really uh, crazy job right now, and Danica has two crazy little children right now, mm-hmm. and uh, it's summer, and of course everyone's on holidays, and I think you guys should just be grateful because a lot of people don't record podcasts in the summer. Yeah, so just be great. Throw be back on <laughs> Yeah. We're just going to gaslight you guys. Yeah. You guys know we love that. So We're learning that technique at home and work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's been a lot of, a little, just like well, a little bit of a shit show. There's been some exciting things, though. Danica got a new career going. I did, yes. So she's going to be doing scalp micropigmentation. Yep. And uh, so that she's done, done the whole course and I watched the kids and that alone was enough to set me back for <laughs> yeah, a while. A lot. And then speaking of watching the kids, I don't know, in British Columbia, I'm not sure if it's like this in all of Canada, but flashback in 2013, when I returned back to work after I had my first child, so my son, I literally looked for a daycare, brought him in the next week and he started and in fact, the rest was history. Right now, you basically, if you guys are planning to conceive, go register your <laughs> baby that's not even made not, yet on, yeah. to daycare because it's a fucking two-year wait list that someone forgot to tell me about. So, I yeah, finding childcare, I'm sorry to every single one of you guys that has had to do that in the last little while because it's a fuck around. If you forget to take a birth control pill, just basically go register for a daycare. Literally, as soon as you forget that one pill, like, register. <laughs> Because there's, although I'm pretty sure that the uh, deposit is like 800 bucks. I just literally had to pay a thousand dollars to get put on a wait list that I don't even know when the wait. They said it could be till 2025. Oh, interesting. One. So shout out to my nanny because I found a kick ass nanny. She's awesome. Ashlyn, I love you. I know I just met you last week, but you hold a really big part of my heart now. So we're doing like that gradual entry. Um, seeing if she uh, will not enter, but I guess she's entering. Seeing if the kids drive her away or not. Yeah. And, and, and how's it going? My youngest. Good. It's going really well. She's super cool, super great, um, really good with the kids. Uh, awesome. Yeah. She's very easygoing, has all her certificates. So, peace of mind, you know. So, yeah. So, wish me luck, everybody, that this continues to go well. Well, my fingers are crossed because I'm the backup baby. You too. are. And like, if I'm not <laughs> you, then it's like, all right, kids, wait in the car. Do the windows down. Just kidding. I don't do that. It's just a joke. But And that's the thing is, uh, I think I've been um, the number one babysitter, but it's my... Only babysitter? Yeah, I've been the only babysitter. So I'm actually really in love with Ashlyn also, even though I just met her today and... For two seconds. Her. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> just we know I mean, when you know, you know. Yeah. I love the kids, mm-hmm. but... You definitely like, and it, it also has sucked because we haven't been able to hang out together in a year and a half because I'm the babysitter. Yeah. And their dad's awesome, but their dad also has a horrible work schedule. So just basically whenever I can, <laughs> wherever I can get, get a moment, then usually it's here. So that's why we haven't been here in a month. So, but we have a nanny now. So that's all right. Murder with my mother has a nanny. <laughs> woo, woo. So woo, woo. Um, there are some things I wanted to talk about. Just in the current events, I was going to tell mom and Dan because he's interested, but okay, this isn't anything to do with murder, but I don't know if any of you guys are keeping up with Rudy Farias. So seven years ago, this, he was 17 at the time. His mom reported him missing. She said he went out to walk the dogs and he never came back. So he was reported missing. Um, 
And for the last seven years, that's what everybody has thought. He's missing. They said that the police go, they check in. She's had a GoFundMe open all these years. <laughs> um, and obviously, you know, there's been donations. I don't think too, too many donations, but it's always sad when uh, somebody goes missing, no matter their age or whatever, right? It's always sad. The U.S.? In Yes, it's in Texas. Okay. So Houston, Texas. So about a week and a half ago, I remember seeing, because obviously you guys know, I'm always on the headlines scrolling to see what I can find. Usually it finds me, so I don't have to really look too hard. But Rudy Farias was found beaten up, scrapes, bruises, but a good Samaritan found him seven years later. Oh my God. Outside of a church in his like local area. So I remember being like, wow. But I remember thinking like, that's kind of weird because now he's 25 years old so did he have a haircut no oh no he didn't have a haircut I don't (laughs) know I didn't really see they've kind of kept him covered but what has happened what has transpired since then was a neighbor came forward and was like Rudy oh yeah we don't really know him as Rudy but we know him as Dolph and (laughs) Dolph comes to our garage every night to kick it oh what the and so it's like, like weird, right? So obviously that you see and the mom's still saying like, no, my son, my son has been missing for seven years. He's found. Please let us, you know, get back to our life. And he's traumatized and he needs time away. We don't want to talk to you. Exactly. Pretty <laughs> much. Right. So kind of like red flaggy, whatever, neon flag. It's come out now that the mom was just lying the whole time and he was being like held captive. <sighs> yeah. And apparently, I mean, not funny, but she has, she's abusive to him, apparently sexually abuses him. I know. And does he have a disability? I am going to say yes, but I'm not 100% sure. Just kind of based on everything. Yes. But he's saying now there's um, interviews with him saying that he has been held captive and I mean, the, the GoFundMe only made like $2,500. So I don't know if that was the soul. It is a little bit insulting. But yeah, so that whole thing is just weird. I'm li- I'm waiting to see what else comes out because it is still pretty And Brad he was going to kick it with people in their garage yeah. every day? Dolph. Yeah. Like, and they, they knew him out? as Dolph, which his name was also obviously like Rudolph or something yeah. like that. Was he get, like, I wonder yeah. if his mom was aware that he was getting out. Probably not. I think she would probably go to sleep and then he would be like, you know, I'll sneak out. Because I think he was probably pretty complacent. Like, yeah, well, no, his mom, He, I think he kind of could gauge like, okay, my mom wants me to not be seen. She's reported me missing. People would come over and he'd be in the house and she'd say it was his ne- her nephew. So I don't know. There, I think there maybe is disabilities. Like, I think the mom maybe even has a disability. I think also if you're raised by someone that fucked up for your whole life since you're born, something's going to be twisting your head. Oh, <laughs> <Well>, yeah. <laughs> you came out pretty normal. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I'm good considering the other side of my DNA. But yeah, I mean, weird. So I'm just waiting to see what happens. So yeah. So, but no like real murdery stuff on the... I also have been like, I had the worst case of food poisoning. So the last couple of days, I was like totally out of commission. So I'll give you. And I'm just always old and tired. So. Yes. And mom also doesn't have her glasses today. So if you if she can't actually read the episode because she did the episode today, then yeah. sorry. So if I say some word that doesn't make sense. Start then... getting it in Braille for you. Yeah, I so apologize. You like, yeah. And I don't know, people don't tell you about daycares, but they also don't tell you that as you get to a certain age, uh, your eyesight actually goes really quickly, like for reading, to the point where I thought that I was actually going to be fully blind pretty soon. So hopefully it's not today. Yeah, well, it may as well be because things are pretty blurry. Anywho, like he tells you that either. Well, I think people actually do tell you that it happens, but you don't believe them Mm -hmm. that it goes that fast until it happens to you. And True. then you're like, oh, yeah, it does happen that fast. Yeah. Yeah. Something cool to just segue into like a, a second segue before we do our final segue. Okay. Um, we got voted fourth best mother-daughter podcast. I don't know how. There's probably fucking five. There's probably <laughs> four on the four. whole internet. But we got voted number four. So, yay. yay. Um, we also got voted number 215 in Canada. For true crime. Oh, so, that makes me happy. Yeah. I mean, again, I don't know how many there are. There could be like 200 only and then we're 215. <laughs> like, I don't know. But yeah, it's kind of cool. Kind of 
Yeah. Um, shout out to my coworker, Roberta, who happened to mention the podcast to her daughter and her daughter said, oh my God, you know them? I listen to them all the time. So that's cool. She lives in Germany? Uh, one of her daughters does, and I'm not 100% sure if it's her daughter that lives in Germany or her daughter here, but it is super cool. And I'm signing autographs every time I go out. <laughs> right. I'm like, oh no, the paparazzi. <laughs> no, just kidding. Everyone likes my hat. It wasn't supposed to be this hat. It was supposed to be the logo, but the place I almost fucking raged because it, <laughs> it didn't rage. But <laughs> anyway, so mom did the episode today. Um, it is an episode that there's a couple things that kind of branch off of this episode. Obviously, um, you guys know how we feel about the criminal justice system in Canada and how our lack of justice for the victims kind of allows these guys to get out guys, girls, whatever you want to identify as. If you're a criminal, usually you're getting out pretty fucking early in Canada. Yeah. I don't like it. It's not something that we celebrate, but it is something that is, um, is just our, that's our life in Canada. You know, you, it, it is a very sorry. Yes. Yeah. Everyone's <laughs> really sorry that you did that crime. But it is a kind of a slap on the wrist country. And um, obviously, you know, there are things that have gone where this case, actually, um, the parent of the person who was the victim of the murder in this case did really advocate for this to be changed because nobody knows how much it affects you until your family member or someone you love is murdered by somebody who should have been behind bars. Right. True. Another thing that this case brings to light is something that I feel quite often. Um, and I'm sure too, and everyone else with a vagina. Yeah. So everyone uh, of the female sex, um, when you think about the things that we have to be aware of and the things that we have to be wary of with safe situations, um, I, for instance, am about to go on a big trip uh to Costa Rica by myself and I'm a very announcement brave. for all yeah. criminals in Costa Rica yeah, oh, yeah. No. Uh, just kidding she's going to a totally different country <laughs> a totally different continent however I'm very brave like I go camping by myself I travel by myself a lot because I'm not going to fucking wait for someone to join me I want to do what I want to do and life is short and I'm about to turn 50 in October so I was like fuck it yo I'm going to Costa Rica and so I booked it and then I realized just through, I think I didn't have my glasses on and fucked up my flight and then I had to book another flight and then I realized that it gets dark where I'm going because it's so close to the equator at between 5 and 6 p.m. And now I'm arriving right at the cusp of dark and there's all this, all these warnings like, even the last shuttle, which you think they'd have a shuttle after dark, like a professional shuttle, but they don't from the airport. And it's about an hour that I have to travel. And it says, like, don't, if you're a female alone, don't take a public bus. Um, all of this stuff is is now coming into my mind. Like, I wouldn't have even thought about that if I was a guy. I would just walk down to the bus stop and, like, make sure I didn't have a shiny watch on or whatever. But the... The thing is, is like, as as a woman, you have to think about things, I think, a lot more than men do. Like, working alone, in this case, the person, the victim of this crime was a young woman working alone. Um, and that's something I think that her father was also very trying to bring awareness to that that type of thing also. So, they have things in place at a lot of workplaces where you will not be the only person alone how shitty is that yeah well it sucks when you have to be the person that changes that right and we've talked about a lot of cases where yeah the laws were one way or the, the way people do things are one way and until somebody's life is lost in a horrific tragic manner like today's case then there is change then there's you know the next person hopefully can r remain a little safer but no but i mean still like can we just stop fucking going after vulnerable people or people that are more vulnerable or people that aren't even vulnerable like well we've talked about it it's these people are they're predators and they're predators usually of opportunity. Have oppor op yeah. you know, opportunity so they know they know and i think it was mark from vancouver true crime who said a lot of people actually come to this province because they know that 
there's more people that they can prey on, like the downtown east side. There are more people that are are vulnerable, right? But today's case is not something that took place in a, somewhere like downtown east side. It's when someone's at their workplace, and that is, uh, I think, a little a little scarier when when it is somewhere that you are supposed to be safe. So, totally. With that, we will get into the episode. Um, so again, this is episode 47. That's what you said? Uh, I think so. <laughs> Everybody. Whatever. Today yeah. is just a cry shoot. your episode, so. <laughs> oh, well. I think the fucking moon's in Mercury again or something. I don't know. Um, so the case we are going to do today is a local case. And um, it is about the murder of a local girl whose name uh, was Melanie Carpenter. She was born in Surrey and raised in Surrey, uh, British Columbia, which is I live in Surrey and Danica lives in Langley and we're right kind of right next to where the crime occurred. Yeah. Um, well, it was in Fleetwood, which is like my y- stomping grounds. Yeah. And uh, this case also really stuck with me because I was uh, around the same age as the victim at the time. Um and was living in the area also, so I remember it very, very well. Um, and as many people know, um, it's just tragic. Like, you're you're killed, you're so young, and um, back in that time, I think it was kind of starting to change a little bit because um, Melanie was born in April of 1971, so she grew up in a time the same time I grew up in, which was very carefree. Like, well, we I talked about, yeah, as is hitchhiking and all of that. Yeah, like, I, I don't know that everyone did that kind of stuff, but I, I think that no one even, like, in the 70s, no one really even won in the house. No. We didn't wear seatbelts. We didn't, like, it's a, it's amazing that there's actually such a big generation of us, really. There are, but <laughs> I think no matter what the norm is for your time, like how you said, you know, hitchhiking, going here, going there, no matter what it is, there's that feeling that you get in the pit of your stomach yeah. or in a certain situation. Like uh, you have said to me before that when you got in a car without your friend, you know, like things like yeah. that. You don't think like about you, that. That's stupid. It it's, is, but yeah. you don't think about that until you're in the situation. And then there's that voice that with all of your being that tells you, I am yeah. safe right now. I have felt it. I'm sure you yeah. felt it. The, yeah. the fact that we're still here to talk about it is miraculous because all of the situations we've put ourselves into. But again, she yeah. was at work. So um, she, like I said, she was uh, born and raised in Surrey, British Columbia. Um, her parents are Steve Carpenter and Sandra Carpenter. Um, by all accounts, Melanie was a very loving and spunky, kind, adventurous child and teenager. Um, she was w- engaged to her longtime boyfriend, um, and she just was living life. Like she had the aspirations to be a housewife and a mother, and um, they were sa- he was saving for her ring and an apartment for them to buy a condo and just typical, yeah, adults. just typical young adults. I'm sure looking at each day with like excitement. Um, she was said to be a champion gymnast in school and, um, she attended the high school of Frank Hurt, which my baby daddy attended. Like lots of people that I know went to that high school. And so she was working at a tanning salon called Island Tan in the Fleetwood area. And she often would work alone. Um, because which is you don't see that anymore. No, and I think it's because of of her that you don't see that anymore. Yeah. So the tanning industry was a pretty big industry back in those days, um, as you guys remember. Probably why I have so many wrinkles. And there was pretty much a tanning salon on every block. Like Danica was going tanning and grading, grading lying about lunchtime. I would go every <laughs> every day with no sunscreen, no lotion, no goggles. I no, actually I wish we see in the dark. I really wish we had a photo of how dark you actually were at that time. Yeah, that was dark. So on, but every time I went tanning, there was multiple women working there. Yeah, multiple, multiple. And so Melanie did have a gut feeling about um, her. Her dad said that she always worried about working alone, and she felt really uncomfortable 
because she would get the attention of a lot of men when she was working. Super beautiful girl physically as well as her whole being. Um, and on the day of January 6, 1995, Melanie dropped off her boyfriend, Aaron, or her fiance, Aaron Bastian, at the Scott Road Skytrain station in Surrey because he worked downtown at Revenue Canada. Uh, it would have been still dark when they kissed goodbye, and when Melanie returned home to get ready for work, it had been raining and it turned into a sunny day. So her morning was uneventful. She worked at the Island Tan, and that was right in the Evergreen Strip Mall, which is very close to where we are right now. It was where the Little Caesars is. I think you. Yeah, I think it's where the Little Caesars is, and there's a bank right there because that 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 comes into play in a minute. Um. So late in the morning, her a man kept calling the tanning salon, and um, he was saying that he represented a group of Japanese businessmen who were interested in buying a franchise from Island Tan. He claimed that the group wanted the salon to themselves so that they could inspect the tanning beds. So Melanie kind of got a, like, she she might have just been thinking, like, oh, this is really important, good opportunity for my boss, or she might have been feeling weird about it because he did call a couple times. Yeah. So she called her boss, Gary Marshall, right away. And he was working at a nearby branch of the salon in Newton. Yeah, because these used to be everywhere. Yeah. Everyone was Island Tan was really popular. Everyone was brown. Everyone was super brown. Um, I guess there's probably a lot of skin cats right now. Yeah, that's probably why everyone has melas. Yeah. Um, so he came, Gary came, and um the guy when the guy called back, she gave um her boss the phone. And suddenly, when Gary was speaking to the man, and Gary said that he was um, a soft-spoken person on the phone, and he had, like, a really good command of the English language. Uh, apparently, I don't. <laughs> um, so, so you're doing really good. Yeah. So during that conversation, um, he said that all of a sudden, one of the the businessmen had become very sick at lunch. So they weren't coming now. Which red flag, because are they not coming because of the man's voice that is now on the phone? Yeah, so I don't think they really even considered that until the man called back again and asked Gary if he could go out and get some hors d'oeuvres for them. They would still come, but can you go get some hors d'oeuvres? And then hung up. So uh, Gary said that him and Melanie both were thinking, like, this is fucking weird. And I can read the word hors d'oeuvres, so. Yeah. I think you're going to fucking sell hors d'oeuvres and bring them for a tanning salon. And isn't the guy sick? Like, you're changing your you're changing your story. So they just, they both really, at this point, uh, just thought that it was a prank caller. Because that was also something back in the day. Like, I think I've said before, I used to order pizza to my neighbor's house and watch out the window every day. I think you said that. But... Because it was the days before caller ID, like... If you called someone and said whatever the fuck, like we used to call, is your fridge running? Like, you better go catch it. No, no there was nothing. 67? Which one was it? I don't know. Uh, I don't know, but we didn't have any of it. It was, it was like you were like seriously incognito if you decided to prank call someone. So they, they kind of figured out, figured that that's what it was. So Gary went back to the other branch around 1.30 in the afternoon and uh, Melanie stayed at the Evergreen Strip Mall branch of Island Tan. And then it was a, about an hour later, Gary got a call from one of the regulars uh, saying that he went there for his tan, but no one is there. It's empty. So he was, Gary right away was like, oh no. Uh, he ran as fast as he could or drove as fast as he could uh, over to that branch. And they're not that far apart. Like Newton and Fleetwood is like probably 10 minutes. Yeah. People probably get there in like 15 to 20, but... Well, it depends now with the traffic. But back in those days, half the people were still hitchhiking. So um, he raced back there and no one was there. Melanie was gone. And the salon's rear door was open and there was $250 missing. So he immediately called the RCMP. And the RCMP came and everyone knew right away that this was uh, a, kidnapping. a kidnapping. 
Yeah. And how scary because that's the last place you expect your child, like something bad to happen to your child is when they go to work. And yes, she was in her 20s, but I mean, she always worrying about your children. She always apparently talked to both of her parents about she had a fear of being kidnapped. And her dad said to her, if you are ever kidnapped, I think just trying to like give her good advice. Yeah, because I think that that's yeah. going to happen. Just comply. You'll be like, just that's do whatever exactly. you want. Yeah, because don't put up a struggle. That's exactly what he said to her. Um, And now he has been quoted as saying, I wish I would have told her to fight with all of her might. Yeah. Just get out of this situation. And as we know, also, and we see a lot now, uh, with any kind of crime, do not let someone take you to another location. Like that's one of the biggest, the biggest rules. If you can get out before you're taken to another location, then yeah. that that um, makes your chances of survival a lot higher. Yeah, and like he said, do anything you can to, because if they're going to kill you, they're going to kill you regardless. If you're going, you know, yeah. If they're trying to take you away and. Usually the motivation of that is sexual. Yes. We know that. Usually kidnapping the motive is always sexually motivated unless it's motivated by money or motivated by, you know, something else. Jealousy is another yeah, one. But usually you're not kidnapping somebody if you don't want something from them. Exactly. So uh, this got out really fast and um, it got out to the media really fast. It got out to um, the police were canvassing the neighborhood very quickly um, a lot of, of the other businesses had also received very similar calls. Um, Melanie's dad, Steve, was on the news right away appealing to the kidnapper. He said, let her go, please. We'll give you anything you want. We don't care. We just want her safe. Um, so the next day it was announced that um, the bank next door, there was a man um, seen on the bank machine security camera uh, making a $300 withdrawal with Melanie's bank card only minutes after she disappeared. And the, the the photograph was shown on TV and published in the newspaper, but the radio could only offer descriptions, obviously, because it's a radio. Uh, the man was balding, about five foot nine, and probably in his early to mid-40s. He was thought to be driving a red Hyundai hatchback, and Steve came back on the news immediately and offered a $20,000 reward for his daughter's safety, for safe return. Um, and he was saying, he was holding up on the news. I, I still remember this. It was so devastating. He was holding up $100 bills and he said, I thought $20,000 would look like a lot more money than this. He said that calls were pouring in. Um, they had set up a volunteer uh, like a station at their at their home, um, but it, there was so many people volunteering to look for Melanie to take calls on the tip line that they quickly outgrew the confines of the home and uh, a space was donated for them at the uh, at the Surrey Inn, which is also gone now, but that's down in Wally. So um, people were wearing yellow ribbons. And just everyone was so riveted to it. Well, think of a community. If you, like any community is really put to its test when someone from their community goes missing. And obviously not knowing who did it. You know, yeah, like there's a like, picture out there, but it's so different now because you have to think like this was before the internet. Yeah. Like I know that seems really hard for a lot of people to understand, but the internet didn't exist. Like it blew my fucking mind when I could just type something and like look at it. Like when the internet came in, it was like my fucking mind. <laughs> and I was, you know, and yeah, you you were born in ninety two. So ask me if I was born in the before the nineteen hundreds, <laughs> and I'm like, well, I mean, no, I guess I was born in nineteen ninety two, which yeah. is in the nineteen hundreds. But like, no, we didn't have. A, in I went into the ninth grade, and that's when Facebook became a thing. So it's like I, you know. Before yeah, like, there was no Amber Alerts either, because no. Amber Alerts again, we'll t we'll cover that case for sure. But that was a case of a little girl named Amber who was missing, and just the importance of knowing as soon as somebody goes missing and you know it's a kidnapping, especially a stranger kidnapping. Yeah, you need to get that out right away. And given the time, the only way they could get it out were 
the, the right. media outlets. Yeah. yeah. And also the news. Also now you you can pretty much like I could go next door to the next office and post a picture of that girl in the yellow shirt and be like, hey, does anyone know this girl? And like I'd probably have an answer like that girl's Kalia from blah 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 in like two seconds because people are Don't so Trisha engaged. because Letitia's probably listening and then I'll get in fucking trouble again. <laughs> that's not who I meant. Yeah, like it, I could probably get I could get a result really quickly, but it took a week for them to identify this man. Which also, given the time, I'm sure the cameras are not as good. So it was a little more grainy. Well, and all they had will post the picture. Like it's it's pretty much the only picture I've ever seen of him. And it is the photo from the bank machine mm-hmm. camera. And I don't know, like everything else is advanced and we got the internet and all that. But why are pictures of people on surveillance cameras still so fucking shitty? You know? Like <laughs> anybody knows that. You yeah, let us please know. let us know. I love asking you guys because you guys always do let us know stuff and it's the best. So Yeah. I remember, though, like, I remember being very, very, very worried about Melanie's safety the whole time. And I remember feeling, oh, scared. And, oh, my God, I can't imagine what that would feel like. And And you also, I mean, because you were just a little bit younger than her at the time, but you already had a daughter at this time. So I think when you have a daughter, being a woman, you also know that fear of because we've all been in that situation as sad and as horrible as that is. Every woman has felt unsafe at one point. It's true. Because of a man. Yeah. And again, you were young. You were around the same age as her. You yeah. you had a young daughter. It hit, and you it hit also, very close to home. You also only watch fucking Dateline and true. every other. But, it, but it's true. Yeah. People who listen to true crime. You're more aware of the things that do happen and the time limits that you have. If someone's not found within 24 hours, that's never a good sign. Yeah. And so going into day two, day three, day four, I'm sure the whole community is in panic because where did she go? And so so he was identified after a week from the surveillance photograph. Um, his name was Ferdinand Auger, and he was a convicted sex offender uh, who worked as a waiter in Alberta. He had recently been given a statutory release after serving two-thirds of an armed robbery sentence uh, in an institution near Calgary. So he did armed robbery, and he is a sexual predator. Yes. So, And he was released early. So once that news came out, Steve... Uh, once again appealed to the media, trying to reach Ferdinand. He said, Ferdinand, you've got my daughter. I want, I've got something you want. I want my daughter back alive. You tell me how to proceed from here. And it was on almost every news update. Um, He was a no-nonsense man with a deep voice. He said, I know my daughter is alive. He said, heartbreakingly, the bond I have with all my kids is very deep. If one of them died, I'd have an empty feeling. It would be like a shiver, like something running through me. Suddenly, I would feel it, and I would know right then. And I haven't felt this, and I know she's still alive. It gives me, like, goosebumps. I know. It's so, oh, so, so sad. sad. So, on the opposite side of the coin, Ferdinand's family was saying that there's no way he could have done this. But they were also saying kind of like he w- he had a really tough childhood and he was abused by a priest and we do he know. grew up in foster care. So trauma. We do know trauma, trauma based. And, in, you know, that is a factor of usually why predators become predators in the first place. But yeah. it's not an it's excuse. It's not an excuse, no. You have to work through your trauma or your trauma will work through you. We know that. So, so, so she was quoted as saying, in our hearts, we don't think he did it. Although... A prison psychologist described him as having a fairly advanced antisocial personality disorder. And people that have run across him um, said he was kind of a loner. He was really polite, but um, he was never rude. But he was like a quiet, kind of strange guy. He never really talked about anything specific. Like he was just kind of a surface person. His old boss said that he was the best waiter he'd ever had. That's helpful in this moment. But... He called in sick on January the 1st and never went to work again. So um, I guess he wasn't that good of a waiter after all. 
Um, he, on January 1st, after calling in sick, he used a friend's credit card in uh, Calgary to rent a red Hyundai XL from uh, rent a the company was called. That I don't know if rent a still exists. I don't think so. No. Yeah. Yeah, I, it might, but it's probably obsolete at this point. Um, rent a wreck, like rent a wreck, like bad car. Yeah, yeah, it was called rent a wreck. Definitely, but it, but it was kind of like now. a spoofy thing. Like it was cheaper cars, but they weren't really. There is it. They weren't really rent in the states that you can do totally off. But you can rent your own car. Like let's say you're gonna go park it at the airport when you're on a trip. Well, we all know how expensive that is. You can rent your car, so it makes money. To someone else to use while they're here. <laughs> Imagine what I'd get my for my own hair, like fucking <laughs> on the tent and the roof. No, I could rent the I could rent the tent also, the rooftop tent. Even. Now we're talking. There you go. But anyway, rent to wrecks probably no longer around. But uh, I'm not sure. I'll check into that. I'll get back at you I'm guys. That. I'm gonna put <laughs> that here. So the manager of the rental car company said that he, the guy did not seem unusual at all, but he was really talkative, which we know is not in his normal mm-hmm. nature. Um. So in the next couple of days, um, the there were no new bank transactions, no phone calls um, coming into anyone. Um, the search area was widened, and there was no sign of Augur or Melanie. Um, and all the while, her parents must have been in such agony. Um, siblings, you know. Yeah. That's not obviously broadcast, but it's like just thinking and just knowing. I mean, like. I have two kids, so it's like to see oh. the relationship and uh, with siblings, and yeah, it's just it's just very very sad. It's a very sad case. And so, um, after ten days, so I guess about three days after he was um, identified, a real estate agent in High River, Alberta, so fifty kilometers south of Calgary, uh, went to show a property. It was a cottage. Um, and she discovered that there was a red car in the garage and it had a green garden hose hooked up from the exhaust pipe into the driver's window and a man's tracksuit jacket was stuffed in the window opening. Although the windshield was glass, it was caked with ice because it was really cold. It was a winter and a figure inside was visible. Uh, so someone was dead inside the car. Um, there was a suicide note found on the vehicle rental inspection report in the spaces between the diagrams of the car maintenance checklist. These words were written. This vehicle was obtained fraudulently by me um, for our auger. So he's calling himself, or, or that's what he's calling himself, Ferdinand Auger. Um, I do not, or please do not hold the credit card holder liable. January 9th, 1995. My death was chosen my way, my choice, my place. And to my family and ex-wife, I love you, but it is better this way. That's it. That's it. Which is like such a fuck thing to do. If you're going to kill yourself, at least give some closure to the person's family or like let them know something. This reminds me of the case in Hope, remember, where he didn't say anything it, same thing yeah and say anything about who he killed he it's, just said like oh, i love you love you family yeah. okay but you're killing you're yourself fuck. exactly but you're killing yourself because i mean maybe he planned on killing himself in the already but you'd think you would just give yeah those i mean that would be the kinder thing to do yeah, especially if you've already done something yeah. um so they did fingerprint um the paper to make sure that it was the the body of Ferdinand Auger. Um, and there were some blonde hairs found in the car, but they were determined not to belong to Melanie, which is also, although like we've said, uh, yeah. hair hair analysis is still not great. So yeah, at that time it wasn't, I guess, yeah. So the area around the garage was searched and there was no trace of her. So anguishing. Um, I can't believe that he wouldn't even mention anything. And Melanie's father said, it's the death of a son of a bitch as far as I'm concerned. Uh, A vigil was held at the playground of Frank Hurt uh, Secondary School, which was her old high school, which we mentioned. 
and hundreds of teens, children, adults, and police officers attended. They lit candles and silent gestures of hope that in silent gestures of hope that Melanie was somehow still alive. Well, that would be very discouraging as the family, especially because now this man who is the, the prime suspect in the disappearance of your daughter is dead. Yeah. Though so that's not, it's not something that I think the family, obviously, yes, they're probably not wishing well for this man, but at the same time that, like, when he died, a lot of whatever went Yeah, his secrets went with him. Thursday, January the 26th, the Bring Home Melanie hotline received a fateful call. The body of a woman with golden hair had been found near the town of Yale, about 160 kilometers northeast of Vancouver, near Hope. A few meters above the Fraser Canyon, the canyon site was described as a place of spectacular and desolate beauty. Steve Carpenter oddly slept only a couple hours uh, the night before, but for the first time since Melanie's disappearance, he dreamed about his daughter and said he, it felt more like she was coming home than a dream. It was a happy, happy dream. She just stopped off to say goodbye to her dad. And the next day was three weeks after the day that she was kidnapped. And it was eight weeks before her 24th birthday. Um, and the next day, the police were able to confirm to Steve that his daughter uh, was dead and that there was a victim, that she was the victim. Um, there was a, tele a televised press conference um, from the Bring Melanie Home headquarters in the Surrey Inn. And Melanie's friends and family listened as police described how her body was found with several knife wounds her hands were tied behind her back, and they said she had been killed within hours of being abducted. Autopsy results later confirmed that Melanie had been sexually assaulted. Pucker. So. I don't know if that's, I know that's probably not, you know. Well, no, all it's, it's reaction. It's reaction, like, so terrible when everyone was so, you know, hoping for such a different outcome. Um, so many people in the community following the story were hoping for the best. And in the end, all of those people came together in a tribute to Melanie. Her, memo her memorial actually um, was held at Pacific Coliseum a day after her funeral, which has never been done before. It was a private, um, like a person's memorial being held at a coliseum mm -hmm. because there were 4,000 people that came. She was beautifully eulogized by her grandmother, her fiancé, and her father. The service was broadcast on TV and radio. Her father said that for 23 years, Melanie had been his daughter and God's daughter, but in death, she has become something more. Um, I passed her on to be Canada's daughter. The service is actually for you people and for Melanie, for the way everyone has taken her into their hearts and all the support you've shown through the search. He then told, this is heartbreaking, how Melanie's young brother had asked if Melanie's eyes were closed or open inside the casket. And he, and he said, they're closed. And he said, oh, just like Snow White. Melanie's father went on to spread awareness about criminals being, like we said before, criminals being released early. And he had many petitions signed and... Uh, he was responsible for a lot of change. That he happened. was responsible for a lot of change. Thank you, Steve Carpenter, because like, you know, we are the women that are now around locally, too. It's like, you know, uh, especially bringing that much. It's it's horrible when something like that happens. But having the community come together probably really kind of solidifies that there are still good people in the world. And like, yeah. you know, that's not... It's happenstance, right? It's like hap that happens and you never know who's going to be a victim of that, especially something random. Like you're at work yeah. and you get taken. But if we could keep the criminals where they belong. Yeah, it would cut down the, the chances. Exactly. A lot. Well, and the sad thing is, too, I would, this case kind of made me think of another case that happened in Surrey, too, where it was actually a, a young girl who went to school with my brother and yeah. she was just on the bus. She got off the bus, but guess who followed her off the bus? A guy who just got out of jail early early for sexual, like I'm pretty sure he was also a sexual predator. Yeah. And he took, he killed her as soon as she got off the bus, like right at some train tracks, just, you know, and it's like, if and I think people that's were still in jail, yeah. 
they wouldn't be killing anybody. If anything, maybe someone would kill them in jail. I don't know if that's nice to wish for, but it's like, seriously, keep these fucking guys in jail or girls or whoever is doing this. Because we always hear, too, there's the case of Tori Stafford, where the girl who orchestrated her murder got put into a healing lodge because she yeah. deserves to heal? On fucking what planet does she deserve to heal? Exactly. No, sorry. Like, I know, again, we've talked about trauma. We know a lot of people go through shit, but there's no excuse to continue the behaviors that maybe were inflicted on you. Um, I obviously know that that's not, uh, like I said, I, I advocate for, for the trauma part, but like not after you've done something like that. If there's, if you are having those thoughts, if you're having anything, you need to seek a tent, like medical, psychi like a psychiatrist or someone yeah. a psycho i don't know you need some kind of psych eval and maybe you need to get help but in this country what are they even going to do for you really like yeah there's a there's a definitely a gap in in a lot of things right now and the medical system is one of them well i feel like they are just waiting for these people to commit these crimes and then it's like oh god i guess we got to reevaluate well, you're going to do with you with you're that. treating the results instead of treating you know the symptoms well and they're more worried about we've i've talked touched on this a lot of times but it's the criminal justice system it's justice for the criminals when are we going to see the justice for the victims and the, the families and the people that are directly affected by these crimes not the people choosing to go commit these crimes because they're the ones that just get off scot-free all the crimes that are happening in vancouver majority of those people are they're they've already offended yeah it's true they are re-offending probably their fourth fifth sixth time but still they're out in the streets and this guy was from a different province but again not coming because shouldn't he have been on parole or probation or someone checking in yeah but him? that's also a gap too like well, i think once you're released and you're in i mean we had a guy living in our coach house for a while that was on probation for killing someone and he would just i'm not going to say who it was but pretty mm -hmm. known person we have a lot of connections <laughs> well, even I had a but dog. remember when the probation officer used to show up he would like schmooze him like and he was off doing whatever the fuck he wanted to do too yeah or even I worked at remember when I worked at that liquor store and there was a guy I don't know if I even talked about this before, before I probably have because this topic comes up every fucking episode oh because this one actually actually really relate Yes. So I was working. I was 19 working at a liquor store. I was working with a guy. Most of my shifts safe. Right. I thought I was safe. Yeah. He was a nice guy. He wasn't bad looking. He was super easy to talk to. He was actually there when I dropped off my resume. OK. So I've worked now probably about 20 shifts with this guy. It was just him and I every evening and we would be in the back. He was like flirtatious, whatever, but not my type. But it was very like an easy relationship. Easy, never right? felt anything. No, well, I never felt anything, but that's besides the point because sometimes that just you don't get that feeling because some yeah. people are sociopaths and they know how to make you not get that feeling. Too. Yeah. But it came out that this guy just got out of jail for raping one of his coworkers at a gas station. And I was working all these ships with yeah. him. You know, and one of the people who came into the liquor store was like, hey, uh, I just want you to know that guy that has been in here, he's a rapist. And it's like no background check done. No, none of that. It's like, That's crazy. Right. And what if I wasn't the only girl working there either? I think like, I mean, I don't know if I give off like an energy where I'm like, fuck around. And <laughs> no, I don't know. But fuck around and yeah. find out. But, you know, what if a girl didn't give off that energy or she was too nice or she was afraid? You know, that does come out. And I've been in that situation where I'm not giving off that same energy. I'm more of, like, yeah. you know, it because some people are scarier than others. And that's, you know, your body doesn't always get those those feelings. But it's true. But you should be safe when you go to work. So, so that's a prime example of of how we kind of want to wrap it up is take care of yourself and know when those feelings are affecting you and also be aware of your surroundings. And sometimes if they put unsafe people to work with you, you won't even know. Yeah, great. So I'm sorry, but. No, but I think stemming from that is 
if you feel like for me, I know once I found that out, it was kind of like, oh, oh shit, you know, but <laughs> That's I, for now I would be like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like I would make a big like I would stir shit up about yeah, that because that's safe. not safe that's your safety yeah. if maybe he wouldn't have kidnapped me and, and murdered me but he could have raped me yeah he could have raped another girl that worked there because he had already done that yeah and he just got off like he just got out of jail he's still probably still to this day on parole yeah but that's not doing yeah it was a very violent him. violent crime yeah so i mean stay safe even in the times where you don't maybe have a whole lot of like you know, you have to go to work or, you you know, it's, it's places where you don't think that you would be unsafe and something unsafe happens. You have the right to refuse unsafe work. You do. Yeah. And that includes if you're working with someone who's giving you fucking heap creeper heap vibes. vibes. Yeah. Yeah. Like or if you feel unsafe working by yourself also. Yeah. Say something. Yeah. Advocate for yourself. Say something. And if you're a criminal, stay in fucking jail. Like, <laughs> I don't know how to reach those people. But so um, on to another topic. We think that we're going to go to Crime Con. We are going to Crime Yeah, we're going to Crime Con. Yes. I just want to say it in case someone was going to follow us there. <laughs> well, no, and I hope that I'm eating mom at Crime Con because she's going from Costa Rica to Crime Con. Yeah, so wouldn't it be ironic? No. I mean, it would be ironic, but it would be horrible. So please yeah. just safely make it there. Everybody else, if you guys are going to Crime Con, we don't have a code or anything like that. So we don't. We don't. Maybe next year. But we're trying one. to find one. Well, this year, we're just going to go and like... Go to Casey Anthony's house. That's pretty much on the. Yeah. It's not even at Crime Con, but we're gonna go. We're gonna Con. go, and we're also just gonna go like fangirl everybody that's there. So yeah, that's anyone great. that's listening and sees us, if you look what look up what we look like, if you just listen to us, yeah, come see us at Crime yeah. Con. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna get some shirts and some hats, and Danica has that hat, but we're gonna get some better hats and shirts mm-hmm. and stuff made. Um, and yeah, we're super excited about it, actually. Yeah. Excited. And it's going to be our first time, really, that Danica has traveled since she's had the baby. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, that case today was really sad. And it was all really of our sad. cases are usually really yeah, sad. But so this one, like, this one, yeah, really. It was, yeah, I think also just having it be down the street, being a female. I mean, females are, someone told me the other day, it's like, oh, you like true crime? It's like when chickens watch the cooking network i was like oh what? because it's like we <laughs> oh, are the victims oh of my most. god well but that's why we relate i mean i think the most interesting things are the things that you can relate the most closely to so yeah well, i guess we are the chickens that watch the cooking network mm-hmm. thanks yeah so, I mean, well it was nice to be back and uh it was and i oh i know it's like every time i say this <laughs> don't even said. believe her i really don't <laughs> believe me but i do really want to try for like every other week that's my yeah, that's goal. I'm I'll get down. There. I'm fucking goal oriented. Yeah. Maybe not lately. Don't have kids because they fuck your shit up. Like, if you want to, yeah. I mean, no, kids are great. As I say, we're really selling them today. Mm-hmm. As soon as you forget your birth control, <laughs> register, register for, for daycare, daycare and don't have kids because if they you're fuck trying your to get shit into, up. Like a Montessori program, fucking before you even get into religion. Before you get your period, yes, register for Montessori. They should send out like. <laughs> fucking math <laughs> emails to girls that are still in high school like all right oh my 10 God. years when you're gonna plan your baby you should you'll just be getting into montessori yeah but. anyway so yeah well that was another episode of murder with my mother the true crime podcast where i talk murder with my mother the blind lady yeah you did pretty good bye guys bye <laughs>